Now, one of the things Absolutely. that people always think is that genetics is a driving factor. And I know you talk about SNPs and how they regulate hair characteristics. Can mm -hmm. you go into that? And if it truly is the truth that genetics are, are the driving factor in, in hair loss, both in men and women? Well, I mean, look, there's, uh, you know, big textbooks that describe hundreds of different types of hair loss conditions. Mm -hmm. uh, how many of them are specifically linked to hereditary causes? Well, I don't know if we'll ever know exactly, but obviously the most common types of hair loss that we see out there, you can see it in a man visible to the naked eye, a receding hairline, balding in the crown. That's hereditary androgenetic alopecia. That's male pattern hair loss that comes from your family. So that is inherited. Uh, along with hundreds of other uh, genetic uh, tendencies of hair color, quality, texture, how soon you're going to notice the hair loss, how fast it progresses, what's the end pattern. Uh, so there's a lot of different variables that can kind of go into that hereditary condition um, and accelerating it or, or making it happen slowly over time. So that's most, most of what we see in the practice. And of course, female pattern hair loss might look a little bit different women might notice not necessarily so much change to their hairline, but more of a diffuse loss in the frontal zone, maybe a little bit of a recession of the hairline. Uh, it might be excessive shedding or loss of ponytail volume that brings them in. Um, that's very common or a widening part line when that occurs. So uh, these SNPs that you mentioned, the single nucleotide polymorphisms are really interesting to me because when we do genetic testing or when we've have done genetic testing in the past, like I think in 2008, 2009, the first tests came out for genetic uh, hair loss uh, testing, we could see what the risk of male or female pattern hair loss was. And then there were some other tests that could basically just tell us, are you likely to respond to one type of medication or another? Are you going to be, for example, androgen sensitive or not? And that can kind of give you a hint as to what route to take. But today, we have a test called Trico test, which is really exciting. And it looks at 16 different SNPs, three polymorphisms on each. So you got about 48 different um, responses that could come out of that test. And it looks at different met metabolic um, pathways, if you will, and also enzyme activity. So just as a great example, one of the things that we use that test to determine is, let's say you've tried Rogaine over-the-counter minoxidil in the past, which was the first FDA-approved drug, and you've tried it for a period of time, you gave it enough time, you gave it a good try, but you didn't really see much of an effect. Well, we didn't really know why 20 to 40 percent of people didn't have a good effect from minoxidil uh, until now. Now we know that there's an enzyme in your skin that converts minoxidil, it comes out of the bottle into minoxidil sulfate, which is the active ingredient or the active metabolite, I should say, that affects the hair follicle uh, um, and its production of the hair fiber. And if you have a low sulfotransferase activity, that's that enzyme, then you're not gonna be a great responder to just the regular over-the-counter minoxidil. And so what do we do then? Well, we would use a, a, a compounded pharmaceutical minoxidil with a booster. And there's a few like tretinoin and others that can be combined with minoxidil to ramp up your body's sulfotransferase enzyme so that now you're a better responder to that medical therapy. And there's a bunch of other things too. You know, there's, you know, collagen production, which is really key for skin and for hair, and for nails, of course. Um, there's also uh, androgen pathways that will create DHT, then DHT is the bad guy that causes male pattern hair loss. And there's a couple of enzymes that create DHT. And we can figure out if there's a high level of enzyme activity, then we might wanna use an off-label anti-androgen therapy. So there's some pretty exciting stuff that we just can now dial down. It's not just, you know, Propecia and Rogaine anymore. You know, we've got compounded minoxidil versions. We've got different types of finasteride, which was the old Propecia. We've got Dutasteride, other types of medications that can go along behind it and uh, really tailor the medical therapies directly to that patient's unique individual genetic makeup uh, using trico tests, which is super cool. So it's another level of personalized precision medicine now for hair loss.